Hello, Professor, just letting you know uh, you're on mute. Uh, okay. okay. All right. So can you hear me now? Yes, Professor. Okay. Um, so we're kind of going over um, looking at um, kind of the second part of the assignment five. Um, so um, Basically, you know, you should start by copying the first come first serve policy .cpp and HPP header file, uh, making copies of those and then renaming it. So, you know, if you want to do, I was going to show doing shortest process next. Um, so, you know, use abbreviations like SPN or HRRN if you want to do um, highest response ratio or whatever. Um, you know, kind of follow the same pattern, and then um, you can use Control F to do a simple find and replace on a single file within Visual Studio. So I'm just going to ch change all the first come first serve FCFS to the SPN in my file here, in the header file, um, or I guess well, I'm, I'm actually in the source file here. So I'll do the source file first here. So um, we'll find all these and replace these. Of course, you should also kind of read through the, you know, so the, the comments here uh, need to be updated after you, um, you know, specifically for whichever scheduling policy that you're doing, things like that. But, you know, this will have the, the start of the API methods that you have to implement um, uh, for your scheduling policy. So let's just get those all changed. Um, and since this is short process next, so another thing, you might want to change these into stub functions because it won't be exactly the same implementation. Um, so, um, you know, we won't have a queue. Um, you know, we're gonna have to do something different for the dispatch. Dispatch is supposed to return a PID. So it might be good just to return uh, the, the PID that indicates that there was nothing to dispatch at this point until you're ready to begin implementing that. Uh, I talked a little bit about last time. So, you know, if you're working on a non-preemptive method, the, the preempt method is easy for this. You just always return false. But if you're working on a preemptive scheduling policy, you'll have to do something there, you know, some actual work to determine whether you should preempt um, at the current time step or not. Um, and then the reset policy, again, um, you, you might have some specific whatever schedule policy. So, so you probably want to stub, stub those out. Um, and I probably should have done the header file first. I should also search and replace um, um, all of these in the header file as well, including make certain that your uh, if def um, um, header uh, guards uh, correctly are renamed. So if you leave those as like first come first serve, you will have problems if you try and include the first come first serve header and your your new header, because if the if uh, if defs um, um, are are the same, it'll exclude stuff that you don't want to. So those do need to be unique within your project. Um, Um, so make certain that you replace all those and save them. Um, again, I'm not going to go kind of go through the comments, but you know, you really should update those. Make certain that those the comments are uh, relevant and stuff like that. So once you have that, you got to get it into the build system. So this is something that we haven't done before. Um, so to do that, you have to go to the make file. Um, Let's open open that up. So what you'll see is this is what we've been using for the, the previous um, four assignments. So we've been using a simple tool called Make to organize the, the um, projects and to make certain that all the files get rebuilt whenever they get modified and are up to date, things like that. So, you know, 
you don't have to learn all the details of, of make. I mean, um, you know, again, it's, it's a simple tool. Um, there are more powerful kind of build systems out there nowadays, but for small kind of projects like this, uh, it's still um, very often used for, for defining the, the build process. Um, so in this case, since we're adding a new um, source file, we need to, you need to go into your make file. You have to be careful that the, the tabs um, are meaningful as syntactic elements in make files here. So um, I'm just going to copy. So you need to add it to the sources. You need to add it to the object files, the, the new um, class that you're trying to add into the build system. And you should add the dependencies down here at the bottom. So I'll, I'll, I'll first just um, select those, control C, control V, get copy to those so I can add in the um, SPN scheduling policy, HPP, and SPN scheduling policy, CPP. Another thing to be careful on this, so you do need to make certain that that, that you kind of, the, the, the white space is the way to make expected. But the other thing is this is all supposed to be kind of one line here. So if you copied it like I just did there, you do need to have that backslash there to indicate that there's still more to this line of the um, source files for the project here, right? So make certain that every line has a, a backslash except for the um, last one here. So, um, yeah, and likewise, you need to also add it as a target object file. So this is what determines which things get compiled, this list of assignment objects here. So, um, so it should be just a single backslash, not a double one, there we go. And again, you know, so it is easy to, to mess up this make file. So, um, you know, if, if you mod, if you edit that, and then when you go and do a build, you get a weird error, error message. You know, email me right away. I can I can help you. <laughs> but yeah, things to check are that backslash, um, and that you haven't like messed up spaces or something like that um, at the front of these. You know, so it really should be kind of uh, about the same amount of space there. Um, and then finally, you go ahead and add in, these determine uh, dependencies. So these are, allow the, the build system to detect if it needs to rebuild your new process, right? So, so if I copy the first come first serve and change that to shortest process next scheduling policy, that should be all you need to do. As I found out last time, I think, I think this line is correct. So basically what this line is saying for the make system is that the object file, the thing that needs to be compiled depends on the .cpp source file called SPN scheduler policy. The, um, um, it depends on the header file. So yeah, there is, there's a typo there. Um, um, the, the, all of these should be depending on the source file and the header file. That, that was what was confusing me last time. So it, it um, probably won't really cause you a problem, um, but um, but yeah, if you want to fix that, um, uh, change it so that scheduling policy depends on the CPP and the HPP file, um, and it also depends on scheduling system. And the first come first serve depends on first come first serve CPP and HPP, and it depends on the scheduling policy. So the reason what that means is that if you make a mod, these are source files. These, these are things that you would go into the editor and actually make changes to. So if you make a change to, I mean, obviously if you make a change to the first come first serve code, you wanna recompile the first come first serve um, object file, right? But first come first serve inherits from scheduling policy. So likewise, if you make a change to the scheduling policy, definition, you might want to recompile. So that's why we also include that as a dependency for the first come for serve scheduling policy and for the shortest process next scheduling policy. So, so yeah, there was a, there was a slight typo in there. I, I don't think that will really cause a problem. What, what that would cause a problem is it wouldn't recompile if you made a change to like the header file since I since I had CPP instead of uh, repeat instead of the header file. But for this assignment, we're mostly not, you're not having to make changes to the header file. Um, but you might have to make changes to the header file for the for the new scheduling policy. So, so it would be good to correct that if for anybody watching this video here. So, but I think that's correct. Um, so the way to test that, you know, so once you've added in that new um, dependency, um, you've added in the your new scheduling policy to the list of objects, and you added in your new two source files to the list of 
sources. That should be all you need. So then you can you can check if it works. Um, so the way to check that um, is you need to rebuild your your project. And and I, I I would suggest that you do a clean build after you change the the, the make file to update your build system. So um, so I'll open up the test file again here. But I'll do you know a control shift one or a make clean to, to make certain that, that we rebuild everything from scratch. So the things to look for is, of course, it, it, it should actually be compiling all these object files, but you want to you want to specifically check after you do that, that it's that you see that it's compiling the um, scheduling policy file that you added SPN scheduling policy .cpp, in this case into the object file. So you should see that in addition to compiling the first come first serve the base scheduling policy class and the base scheduling system class um, and the tests, right? Um, so, so you should see that it's compiling your policy um, and you should see when it goes to link these in that it's including your policy that you added when it links in the tests here and when it links in the, uh, the, the, the overall simulation of our scheduling um, system simulation here, right? So that's that's kind of what you're seeing here. And then you know, if if, if you see this compile without any errors, um, it, it should run the tests. Um, so if you do a Control Shift three or or a make a test, it'll run. Of course, some of the tests will be failing, but um, many of the tests will be failing. But um, you know, it's good to make certain that the tests are still running as well. So. And then one final thing that I didn't really get into uh, last time is that um, even after you've added the the scheduling system. Um, you might not be able to run the the, the problem in the these the your new scheduling policy unless you make some modifications to the main um, uh, program itself. So let, let's let's show that as well. So once you get it compiling and running, um, and you really shouldn't do these steps until you get the the first four tasks of the assignment done. So I'm kind of assuming I haven't done this yet, but I'm kind of assuming that you've already completed. Um, you know, the, uh, the the task where you've added in and got working the getter methods and you've got, you know, the um, um, uh, the dispatch CPU of idle and those things working, right? So, so, so do those first before you work on this part. But uh, if you have that working, then you can add in uh, your scheduling policy. And then um, in order to be able to run it from the command line, run simulations with your new scheduling policy, we probably do have to add it into the um, um, uh, the simulation, right? So if you add, if you open up the assignment five sim.cpp, this is the file that includes the the actual main function that's called when you try and run a full simulation from the command line. And I'll show that again. I mean, you know, we've shown that a little bit. That's that's what the system tests do for all of our assignments here. So if you look in here, though, you'll see that um, 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 here's the uses message. Uh, let, me, um, uh, let me show an example of doing that there. So let's open up a terminal. Oops, didn't mean to split. So, um, so it, it rebuilt um, the simulation um, and it compiled in the, the, the class that I added, the short process next. Um, but um, um, you know, we still haven't really added in so we can actually invoke a simulation with that short process next yet. So um, from the command line, you know, you can run the simulation by hand. So, so if you do just dot slash sim, it'll end up, if you don't give it any command line arguments, it'll end up calling this usage message to tell you um, the correct way to use the program. So uh, this particular simulation takes uh, two required parameters. So you have to specify which policy you want to use, and then you have to give the, the name of the simulation file. And then you can also, uh, like if you're doing round robin or something that uses a time slice quantum, you might, might want to pass that in as a fourth parameter. So, so by convention for usage messages like this, when you have square brackets, that usually indicates like an optional command line argument here. So, so what's that saying though, is that um, um, the, the, the first thing, the first command line argument is supposed to be the name of the policy, but um, currently um, if we look in here, um, 
we only have first come first serve, right? So if the policy name given, right? So, so we've already given you that it parses the command line arguments. It, it expects the, um, um, so here it expects the first command line argument that's in the argv to be the policy name, right? So it pulls that out of the command line arguments. And then here, if the policy name is first come first serve, it creates a first come first serve scheduling policy to be the policy that's gonna be used for the simulation when we, when we create a scheduling system, right? So if we wanna do source process next, we have to add that in as well. So for example, So we'll use the abbreviation SPN for short process next here. So if the policy name is short process next, we want to create a policy using a, um, or actually already have like an example of it down there, but um, um, we, we, we want to dynamically create an instance of a shortest process next scheduling to, uh, policy to use for the simulation, right? So here, um, and um, you know, you have to include your header file, right? So the the declaration of the SPN um, instance um, is in that header file that we just created here. So, so we need to add that as an include so that we can make an instance of the short process scheduling um, policy, right? So presumably once we include that header file that has the, all the, the declarations for the short process next class, you know, including, um, um, invoking the default constructor. So we're just invoking the default constructor. You know, we're not giving any uh, input parameters when we create the new instance of our object. But that should give us a policy. Um, and then, you know, it, it'll use that policy for our um, um, our scheduler here, right? Um, for our simulation. Um, so again, once you add those in, you should you should do a, a rebuild, make certain that it rebuilds, especially it rebuilds the and, and relinks the, um, the 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 sim um, executable. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna do. Um, I often kind of just rebuild everything from scratch just to be um, careful about these. I want that split. But here, kind of the, the important thing is that when we rebuild the, um, or when we relink the SIM, um, you know, um, um, it should, um, um, here, it, it correctly compiled that, that file that had the, the, the main function for the assignment file SIMs. We didn't get an error. We compiled that and it, it was able to link it together. So now we've got the SIM that should be able to support um, running simulations with the SPN, although, you know, we've still got like a stub implementation of SPN um, so far. It's not really doing anything, but, um, um, but yeah, if it compiles, we can, we can try it out again by hand. Um, so let's uh, open up a terminal. So, um, I don't remember if there was any error checking code in there. So like if we give it a policy that it doesn't know, yeah, so it should give us an error if, if it doesn't hit one of these if cases at the end here, right? And then immediately exit instead of trying to run. So, so for example, um, if we say um, round robin and we, we, we haven't implemented round robin yet. Um, so the, the, you know, the, the, the second command line argument is supposed to be the name of one of these sim files um, in the um, um, sim files directory. So, um, we want to run a simulation using round robin um, on the, um, uh, the first process table um, set of, of, of processes, right? So, um, and, and yeah, it, um, current valid process, current valid policies are first come first serve, you know, so we could update that, add that into our um, error message here, so.
by recompiling that. So, um, yeah, I added in that, so it says what the current valve policies are. So now, you know, if everything's working, we can try, um, you know, if you got that in and you got it into your main function for the simulation, we can try uh, and actually invoking that where it creates the SPN policy. Um, but yeah, like I was saying, it was always returning idle, so it's not going to schedule anything. We might even crash here until we begin implementing. Um, yeah, so uh, it actually ran, um, but um it never scheduled anything. So everything ended up having to start in time of minus one, right? So, so kind of nothing happened in that case. Um, but yeah, in, in any case, I mean, if you get that far, then, I mean, you are good to go then on trying to implement your own um, uh, policy and, and, you know, um, it's good that I kind of showed again running the simulation. So probably the best way to debug your own policy, um, like if you're doing short process next um, or whatever, is to you know run the simulations by hand, and, and um, you can see the results that you get from running the simulation, right? So the um, the the process table one that I gave here. So this is the same schedule as the example schedule from our textbook. Right, so, so if you look at that, you know, we've got five processes with process A arriving at time zero, B at time two, and so on. And then the third column is the, um, uh, the service time for these processes. So um, let me bring up our, my textbook here, our textbook. Um, So if you look in chapter nine, um, at the examples under the, the section 9.2 of the um, scheduling algorithms, um, we should be, the, the, the process table one should be the same process table. So that means that, for example, if, if you implement short process next, you should get the same schedule um, if you implement it correctly. Right. So short process next is non-preemptive, um, so it ends up running A first, um, and then at, at this point, uh, time uh, four, um, um, we've got, um, at time four, we've got B and C to select from, so the B, C came in exactly at time four when, um, uh, no, a, a service time is only three, one, two, oh yeah, so at, at time three, only B is available. Um, so B gets run, but then uh, that then at time nine, in this case, uh, we do have uh, a choice finally. So at time nine, we've got C, D, or E, and the shortest process of those is E. So we should see E run um, on shortest process next, followed by the second shortest, which was C, followed by the third shortest. So that was a short process. So you know, if you were doing shortest process next, um, this is a non-preemptive. Um, scheduling policy, so you would um, implement, so you, would, you wouldn't have to do anything to implement, um, um, uh, the preempt method, right? So since source process next is non-preemptive, you can just always return false. You never want to preempt the current running process, right? Um, and then to implement, for example, um, your actual um, dispatching function, you, you have to keep track of which processes are currently waiting uh, for source process next, right? So, you know, again, you could, you could probably use, uh, it's not really a ready queue anymore uh, because you're not going to take the one that's been waiting the longest. Uh, you just want a list of the current processes that are um, um, uh, currently ready to run, but um, um, are waiting to be scheduled. And then you have to search through that list to find, uh, looking at the service time of each process um, and find the one that has the, the shortest service time. 
and select that one and return it as the um, as the next process to um, schedule. Um, so that's the heart of the dispatch, right? So, um, um, so yeah, here you know you might want to have, use like a standard template library list or something where you keep a list of process identifiers, and then every time you're asked to dispatch. You would search through that list um, and you'd have to access the process table um, in the simulation so you'd have to use the the, the sys um, um, to access the process table from the simulation uh, but find out the um, service time of each process and remember which one has the shortest one um, of the current ones that are waiting and if no process is currently waiting when dispatch is called uh, for any of these scheduling policies, if there's nothing that's ready to run or nothing that's waiting to run, uh, we should return idle um, because the, the CP should be uh, idle for that time step if nothing is um, actually available to run uh, right now when, when the CPU becomes idle. Um, So yeah, it's short remain time. Um, it is preemptive. So it would, you know, if you're looking for a little bit more of a challenge, it would be a little bit tougher than SPN. So here, you know, basically, whenever you're asked to preempt, uh, you'd have to check if a process is arriving at that time step or not. So again, you'd have to go back to the the um, um, to the um, the, the, the hook that you have back to the system, to, to the, uh, the, the simulator. But from there, you can find out what the current time step is. And then at that time step, you can search the process table to see if any process is arriving. And if a process is arriving at that current time step, then you should return uh, true that we need to preempt at that point. And if no process is arriving at the time step, you do return false, right? So that's, that's an example of, of how you would implement a preempt for for a particular scheduling policy for a shortest remaining time, which is preemptive. Um, yeah, and in this case though, then uh, for your dispatch decision, it's somewhat similar to shortest process next. Um, so you you wanna keep track of a list of the processes. Uh, in this case, the, the, it could be a list of processes that uh, either haven't run yet or have partially run. So in that case, you have to search through not the service time, but um, every process keeps track of how much time it's used. So you'd have to calculate the remaining time um, and um, um, search through those to find the one who's, who has the least amount of remaining time. Um, All right, and so, so yeah, I mean, those are kind of um, um, two examples, you know, of what you might do for, uh, for scheduling policy. Um, Oops, so I missed out on like first four of those. Uh, have issues with uh, uh, is CPU idle, idle and get, uh, getting process, processing names? Okay, uh, we can go back and look at those. So those are from kind of the first part. So you want to talk a little bit about the um, um, some of those uh, first few functions then? Uh, yes, sir. Like it's CPU idle, I was checking. Uh, we have a member variable uh, CPU in the header file, and I was checking uh, if, if that CPU value is set to idle, then uh, is the CPU idle? Isn't that the right way? Um, yeah, that should be right. So basically, um, in the scheduling system, which is the simulator, um, there is a private variable which is supposed to have the PID of the current running process, right? So, so if everything is working correctly, whenever a new process is dispatched, the, the identifier of that process um, is going to be set to that. But whenever no process is running, um, that should always be set to um, um, the flag idle. So negative one is not a valid process ID. So we, uh, we, you know, the valid process IDs are zero, one, two, three, um, and you can use the process ID to index into the um, um, process table, um, but but yeah, if if the if the uh, CPU is set to idle, you know, or negative one, then the CPU is idle, and if it's not idle, then you know, so if it's not that negative one, then it 
um, the CPU is actually currently running something. So yeah, that should be all you need to check for the is CPU idle method, I think. Uh, I mean, like, do I just check the check if CPU equals like idle? Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So if the CPU is equal to idle, then um, you know you're going to return um, true. You know that from that function result, it's idle. Otherwise, you're going to return false. It's, it, that's an indication that it's running something besides that idle dummy flags. It's running an actual process. So, so what about like getting processing names like uh, that returns the string? Yeah, getting running process name, a little bit more complicated and you have to access the process table. So again, uh, from the CPU, um, oops, from the um, um, CPU variable, if the, the CPU is not idle, this will be um, um, an integer index, zero, one, two, three. Okay, so, so given that you can use that uh, CPU process identifier to access the uh, process table. Okay, so so this um, uh, thing called process is actually uh, an array that's dynamically allocated. Um, so so assuming that CPU is not negative one, so assuming that there's actually a process currently running, this would give you the uh, entry in the process table for the current running process on the yeah. CPU. And then from here, so, so since this is a, uh, an array of process objects, you can look at the, the, the it's really just a, a straightforward structure. So it's not a full-blown class. So you can get things like the name, right? So, um, so you know, that's the, the name, which is, which is a string. That, so that's the name A, B, C, D in most of our, um, test files of the current running process, assuming CPU is not negative one, it's not idle right now. Yeah, that's what I did, I think. Uh, so we were, we were first checking if uh, the CPU is idle and if CPU is not idle, then we're indexing the value of CPU to process table and then use the dot, uh, dot name method to get the name, right? But, but the basic idea, right? So I, I think I can't remember exactly what we specified there, but yeah, if this, if it if the CPU is idle, I think you're supposed to return like a, a string of idle. Yeah. Um, or it might not say here. You might have to look at the tests. Uh, but if, if the CPU is not idle, then you're supposed to return the name that you grab out of the process table there. So, so let me look at the test real quickly here. So um, when we're testing. Um, uh, get processing. Yeah, so it is supposed to return like a string of idle um, if the CPU is currently idle. Otherwise, it should be returning um, um, that process name, A, B, C, as a string or something. So, so as you said, like we're simply returning uh, uh, process um, and then the index and dot name, right? Right. And that's a string already. So that's is the it, string already, yeah. Yeah, is, uh, just a, just a, uh, system automatically assigns those string um, or we do have to do it manually like uh, we as assign the name like a b c d to the process uh, no so for example uh, basically the the process table gets filled out at the start of the simulation so uh, we can trace that um, but but yeah there's a function called load process table so that's ultimately where that that name of the sim file gets passed into the load process table. Um, and, and this should be called before that we, we start actually running the simulation. So it will actually load that information from, uh, I think I've already got, um, I guess I don't have it opened up. So, you know, like an example of, of the process table, the process table one is something like that, right? So um, if you look at, um, the, um, Uh, if you look at that function here, what it does, not, I didn't mean SPN, I got too much stuff open here. Um, so, there you go. So, if you look at that uh, load function, um, 
it basically opens up the file um, and, and reads it in line by line. So it, it assumes, uh, so, so part of this is it actually dynamically creates the uh, process table, right? So here, um, if, if the process table currently has something in it, it deletes the old allocated memory and it um, um, allocates a new one. And it allocates a, a table of, a, of enough size to fit the current simulation, okay? So that's what the first value is. So the first value of here, the first line is expected to be the number of processes in the simulation that we're about to run. Okay, so, so, so we pull that out um, um, first um, after opening the file and we dynamically allocate our process table. And then after that, we expect every line to have three columns, you know, the, the, the name of the process, the arrival time and the service time. Um, and then, yeah, we start with at a process identifier of zero to, in, to go to index zero of the table. Um, so so at, when you dynamically allocate this, remember this, this is a, a table of, um, of, of, of process structures, right? So every one of those items in the process table has all of those fields for the structure, right? So, so we're pulling out the process uh, name, um, and initializing the table with that, and we're pulling out the, the, the process arrival time, which is the second column, initializing that, and pro pulling out the process service time, and initializing that. And we initialize the other things, uh, the start time, the end time, the amount of time used. Those get, those get set as the simulation runs. Um, and, and initially, the process hasn't run, so um, it's not done yet uh, before we start the simulation. So. But yeah, in short, you know, you don't have to set those. Those get loaded. Um, the, the process name, arrival time, and service time get loaded at the start of the simulation, depending on which um, sim file you specify from the command line. Okay. Or which, before yeah. we run, the, so before we run the test, we have to uh, sim the files in the command line manually. Uh, yeah, or, you know, um, before we do make test, um, do we have to um, choose the same file first, like the commands you ran? Yeah, kind of. Or if you look at the, the, the unit test where we're testing things by hand, you know, we, we create a simulation, but before we do stuff, uh, we actually load a particular set of processes from a process table. So we're, we're explicitly ca calling load process table in the unit tests, okay? Equiva equivalently, if you run a simulation by hand, you're, you have to specify, um, you have to specify the process table as the second parameter, right? So you're, you're specifying the process table there um, and that, um, so, you know, if I do my simulation using first come, first serve um, for that process table one again, um, it should run first come, first serve. And this is being passed in as the name of the process table to use to simulate, right? So, again, if you go back and look at the... Um, the main file for the sim, it's expecting the name of the process table to be a second command line argument. Um, and then after it creates the simulation object for using a particular policy, um, it uh, loads that process table that you specify as the second command line argument. Um, so, so that's when you're running a full simulation from the command line, how it does it. Professor, in uh, question number three, the third uh, process uh, that talks something about uh, dispatch that we need to call from the policy instance. Uh, how do we do that? Are you talking about the uh, the yeah, dispatch, here? yeah number three dispatch CPU if idle right. Uh, it is talking about um, calling the dispatch function from the policy instance. Okay, sure. Um, so yeah, this is where you're actually gonna be using the policy object, right? And you have to call the dispatch function on your policy object um, in the dispatch CPU if idle. So basically, um, and this is kind of where the object oriented um, um, 
um, comes in here. So whenever you create a scheduling system, um, normally we use this constructor. So we specify the particular helper policy object, the, the scheduling policy object that's being used by the simulations. Okay, so um, um, so if you look at that constructor, um, all it does is take the policy um, and um, um, it saves it here, right? So that, that's a private member variable of what is the current uh, policy object, you know, first come, first serve scheduling policy, source process, natural, whatever. So any, some, from any function, you can call policy uh, and invoke a method on a particular policy, oh. right? So, you know, uh, so if you've got a particular policy, and, and again, this is where the, the abstract base class comes from. So all these policies uh, implement the same uh, API, including all scheduling policies have to implement a dispatch method, which doesn't take any parameters as input, but returns the process identifier of the next process that's supposed to be um, scheduled by that scheduling policy. So yeah, in, in short, um, um, you're basically going to be calling dispatch um, um, on the in, in somewhere inside of the dispatch CPU if idle. So you first check if the CPU is idle, and if it is, um, you would be doing something like um, uh, invoking dispatch on your scheduling policy that returns a PID. Right, and then so that would tell you the identifier of the, of the process that should be scheduled now. Um, and so, so after that, you have to set your CPU to be that process that was uh, that you were told to schedule that process ID um, and maybe do other things. So. Right. All right. Um, All right, good questions. Um, so yeah, that was the dispatch CPU vital. Yeah, that's that's all I wanted to know. So. Okay, yeah, sure. So I'll just let it. So yeah, I mean, uh, you know, if, if people get that one, there's only kind of one more to do uh, before you implement your own scheduling policy. So yeah, for the check pot process finished, if there is a process that's running, you basically have to look at up in the process table and determine if the amount of time it's used is equal to or greater than its system time, in which case um, um, you should be returning true probably indicating that the process has used up all of its um, um, service time you know, that it said that it needed to run. So. Professor, so when we implement all these uh, four uh, first four functions, we should be able to just um, um, do uh, make all and then uh, run the test, right? Right. Yeah. So um, yeah, and if you get if you get done with those first four, um, when you run the test, all the tests should be passing, assuming that you get them all correct. But but yeah, that's right. So so if you do a uh, make everything um, and then run your tests. Um, once you get through the last um, task four, um, you should be passing all the tests at that point um, if you get them all working correctly. Um, And we're supposed to just uh, implement only uh, one another um, uh, scheduling policy. Just um, yeah, so you're required to implement at least one. Um, so yeah, you only have to do one um, okay. for the second part. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Um, all right, um, yeah, and um, I think, you know, so that was pretty good. I think we covered kind of everything I was thinking about on the assignment um, uh, five here. Um, 
But uh, yeah, I'll stick around a bit here. I'll probably stop the recording and go ahead and post this. Um, hopefully this will be helpful for other people. Um, I'm still working on the assignment five. Um, I still have the due date tomorrow for both the problem set and the program assignment. Um, but um, um, it, 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 it would be especially good, you know, try and, try and get the problem set done. Um, but um, I, I'm probably not going to be grading the program assignment for a bit. You know, so I've already told some people you're probably fine if you keep, keep working on it over the weekend or so. Um, um, so probably sometime next week I'll begin grading uh, the fifth uh, well, program. So, um, but you know, I encourage you to, to to try and get it wrapped up. So I'm mostly trying to get this course wrapped up uh, at the end of the actual uh, final week of classes, so that uh, people with your other courses um, can have more time to concentrate than on if you have. Uh, uh, full file exams during finals week and stuff like that. So. Professor, we only have uh, test five remaining after these two assignments, right? There's no final exam then. That's right. Yeah. So we're just going to have another, uh, we're not going to have a comprehensive final exam, but we'll just have the fifth test over the, the unit five. That is due next week. Uh, yeah. Yeah, and we're gonna, yeah, we're going to do it next week. So be the same as before. So I'll have it open like Thursday and Friday. Uh, I think that's what we've been usually doing. So. Um, oh, okay. And you can take it at the end of next week, basically, cool. and wrap that up. All right, um, I'm going to go ahead and, and stop the recording here. Um, keep sending emails as you're working on stuff. Um, and yeah, I'll stick around for a bit, see if anybody has some more questions. But um, that's it for this um, session.